hole where he is. So it uh, is. Hey, I just uh, hit the uh, record button. It's cold, so I'm a little uh, behind. So uh, maybe uh, just re- redo that intro. We'll just the, the audience pretend you didn't hear that. Okay, audience, you didn't hear the first introduction, but here we go. Welcome to Wi-Fi. I can do it better this time because I had a practice run. Welcome to Wi-Fi in office and enterprise. In this webinar, we're going to talk about how to do Wi-Fi in offices and enterprises in enterprise environments, uh, if you couldn't tell. Uh, my name's Joel. I'm the technical trainer here at Ekahow, and uh, and I'm not sure whether I'm the co-host or whether Jerry is the co-host. I'm probably the co-host. Uh, with me is uh, Jerry Ola, who is our product manager uh, out of, uh, let's see if I can get this uh, right right this time, out of Wisconsin, where it's super that's right. cold right now. That's, that's, that's really the real reason we need to redo the uh, intro, is to make sure you got that correct. I got it wrong the first time, so... <laughs> Great. Well, everybody, thanks for joining uh, today. We really appreciate it. Uh, Maybe some quick uh, housekeeping items. Uh, First off, if you're wondering if this webinar is going to be recorded, yes, we are recording it and we will post it uh, to uh, ekahow.com. I believe it's ekahow.com forward slash webinars. Nah, there might be, that might not be the right link. So go click around on our website and find our webinars page and, and you, you will be able to uh, download this webinar or view this webinar within 24 hours of its completion. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the course of the webinar, we love questions and we love dialogue. I think that's what uh, a big part of what makes uh, ekahow webinars so much fun. Uh, is there's there's really two big ways that you can interact with us. Uh, the first way, if you have a formal question, is to use the Q and A tool. So you can put your question in there. And uh, what we love about that is you can also uh, you can also upvote other people's questions. And so if somebody has asked a question there that you think is good, go ahead and give them an upvote. And uh, Go ahead and give them an upvote, and that that will move up higher in the, the list. And we'll answer some of those uh, as we go. Some of them we'll keep them around for the end. Kind of depends on the question. Also, a more casual way to communicate with us is through the chat tool. And so if you direct your chats to all panelists and all attendees, that will allow everyone to hear you. And, uh, and that way you can, uh, uh, that way you can kind of, uh, if you have some comments or things like that, that you'd like to give us, then, you know, do that. We love to see, uh, we love to see uh, people chatting. And so please go ahead and, uh, and use that tool. So I think Jerry just fell off the webinar, uh, probably due to the extreme cold. Uh, I, I think that the packets are going slower is probably the issue. So, uh, I, I believe that he is uh, working on heating up those ethernet cables and uh, things right now. Or are you still there, Jerry? I'm back. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, I had to switch computers. My, my other computer froze. Get it? Yeah, (laughs) I get it. (laughs) Nice work. Cool. Well, uh, well, I just got all the, uh, I've just got all the housekeeping stuff out of the way, Jerry. So I think we can probably start uh, talking about the, uh, the topic at hand now. So, uh, uh, just a little uh, little agenda so that you know what to expect uh, through the course of this webinar. Uh, we've already done the introduction, so check. We are good to go there. Um, uh, and what we want to do is uh, we want to kind of get you guys primed here and start thinking about what are some common mistakes that you see in enterprise. And so don't put those in the chat quite yet, but just be thinking about that. What are some common mistakes that you you see in enterprise? We'll collect those from you a little bit later on, and that's going to kind of help shape the course of the webinar. Uh, and then we want to talk about, you know, how do we avoid those mistakes? How do we avoid making mistakes when we're doing Wi-Fi design uh, in office and enterprise environments? And we also want to talk about how to incorporate the client devices into your design. You know, as you're thinking about designing a network, how do we incorporate clients into this whole process? We'll discuss the the process. And then of course, of course, we're going to do a bunch of live demos, uh, both along the way and, uh, and towards the end. So that should be, uh, that should be a lot of fun. Jerry, I've done a lot of talking. Do you have any comments or anything so far? Cause it's mostly been me. You've done a lot of talking and what have we covered so far? The agenda? That's all we've done is we've, we've covered the <laughs> intro slide in the agenda. So Right yeah, that's all. That's all we've. Uh, that, that's uh, pretty much all we've done. So maybe we should. Uh, maybe we should talk about what uh, bad Wi-Fi in uh, in enterprise looks, or what bad enterprise Wi-Fi looks like. Does that sound like a plan? Sounds like a good place to start. Cool. So we pulled a bunch of subject matter material from a website that we enjoy very much, badfi.com. Badfi.com is run by our good friend, Eddie Ferrero. He is one of our, our good friends here at Ekahow and one of our ECSC, that's our Ekahow Certified Survey Engineer Instructors. We love him to death and he runs this excellent uh, website called badfi.com that we highly recommend checking out. But we cherry picked a few of our absolute favorites of mistakes in uh in wi-fi so i don't know i think we should start here jerry do you have any comments about this one what is wrong with this mistake in enterprise wi-fi 
you know, every time I bring up this picture, usually there's some uh, some person that comments about the uh, the vendor type of the AP, and that's the uh, the problem. But uh, you know, that's not really what we're after in this uh, this webinar. Is you know. You know, to me, it's all about AP placement, right? And yes. uh, you know, this is not uh, not the the proper AP placement for uh, multiple reasons. You know, really, you know, when it, when as a good general rule of thumb, you want to place the APs and you know, keeping those antennas in mind as close to your clients as possible. And uh, obviously, above a bunch of metal and next to a bunch of metal is not going to provide good connectivity. So as I'm thinking about, you know, as I'm thinking about where the AP is placed, so maybe we'll draw like a little cross section here and say that, you know, like this is the, uh, this is the, the plenum up here and, you know, plenum's usually full of, of metal. And in this case, it's full of conduit and things like that. Uh, we always want to mount the APs close to the client devices because when we're close to our client devices, that little box is supposed to be a phone. It's a terrible drawing, I know. But when we get them close to the client devices, what do we get? Well, we get higher signal strength, or more importantly, more signal to, a higher signal to noise ratio, which means more speed. We can talk faster, we can get on the air faster, we can get off the air faster. It's just gonna result in a more efficient network overall. So in this one, I'd say the mistake is placing it up in the plenum. We definitely wanna get those down below the ceiling tiles where we can be, uh, where we can be close to the client devices. Uh, another uh, kind of fun example uh, uh, that I like, Here's another, here's another mistake in Wi-Fi. Jerry, what do you think is wrong with this one? Yeah, this was a recent one that uh, I saw Stephen Cooper uh, share if, you're, uh, if you follow Stephen on, um, on Twitter. Uh, but uh, yeah, the uh, interesting thing with this one that I noticed was, uh, you know, this is, I think this is really perfect for this webinar because, um, you know, how often do we see this type of um, kind of knee-jerk reaction, I'll call it, to Wi-Fi? So uh, I'm not exactly sure the the you know, what this is, but let's, you know, say this is maybe in the back of a conference room or something like that. And, uh, you know, usually this is the result of, you know, the, the Wi-Fi initially not being properly designed. And then, you know, users go into a conference room and they can't get connected or they're, you know, having an unstable connection, uh, slow Wi-Fi, that kind of thing. And what do we do? We, we put an AP in that area, but now it's kind of after the, you know, installers have left and things like that. So we're just going to set an access point on a desk and uh, plug it in and, you know, say problem solved. But, you know, looking around there, you know, this picture here, we've got some bottles of water that could easily get knocked over and drink cups and things like that. And now we have, yeah, electronics that should be properly mounted on like a ceiling or a wall that are laying on a, on a surface that could easily get spilled, uh, you know, onto and obviously just for signal propagation purposes as well, you're not going to have as ideal uh, uh, connectivity to that. Yeah. And I'm also thinking, you know, like antenna patterns are kind of a big deal and I, we could tie into Akaha really well here. So I'll, I'll draw, I'll draw. There's, there's our, our AP up there on the ceiling. Uh, typically when these APs are typically designed to be, I don't know about this AP very specifically, but most APs are designed to be ceiling mounted. They, uh, they, you know, they, they do use an omnidirectional uh, antenna. You know, it's typically kind of a, kind of a torus shape. Uh, something kind of like that, but they typically are designed to be up on the ceiling. And so they can kind of, you know, they're, they're going to provide slightly more signal strength downward than upward. It's not universally true. That's certainly not universally true, but most APs are designed to be ceiling mounted. You don't want to, you know, now we're providing plenty of coverage up here. Uh, we might not be providing coverage where we actually need it. And so, uh, of course, that's very subjective from AP to AP, but uh, it's important to look and see, you know, what does the manufacturer recommend as far as AP placement and AP mounting goes. Okay, so last one, I personally made this mistake. I've accidentally done this one several times, you know, <laughs> just uh, mounted an AP and just accidentally put tinfoil all over it. Yeah. So, you know, you're working with aluminum foil, tin foil, and, uh, you know, it just kind of goes everywhere, right? And uh, all of a sudden, next thing you know, your access points are wrapped in uh, <laughs> aluminum foil, and, uh, you know, it really makes a mess of the RF environment. So, yeah, yeah. You wanna be careful with that stuff, you know, it kind of just goes everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> But for real, uh, let's dive into some actual, uh, uh, Michael says the aluminum foil keeps out, out the bad frames. Yeah, maybe that's it. Uh, <laughs> it only lets for, the good frames through. Right, it only lets the good frames through. But, but for real though, what we want to get is uh, we want to get uh, kind of some feedback from you guys. And we're going to do a little live PowerPoint editing here. Jerry's going to keep an eye on the chat here. And we want to find out from you. Uh, what, uh, what are some common mistakes that, that, that you, the audience are seeing in, uh, in enterprise and office Wi-Fi? Uh, what, 
whoops, I advanced a slide and I did not mean to do that. What are some common mistakes that you see? Go ahead and put those in the chat. Uh, or, you know, uh, there was one that was put in the Q&A, but either way is fine. Yeah, go ahead and put, them, put those in the chat and, uh, and maybe I'll add those, kind of add those to the list here. Oh, that actually exits PowerPoint. Oh, <laughs> well, that's kind of a problem. Uh, uno momento, while, we, uh, while I get back, there we go. Okay, that wasn't too bad. So what are some common things? Jerry, do you see any good yeah, ones in there? That getting, getting a lot flooding in here. So let me try and scroll through the list here a little bit. All right, yeah, here's a good one. Hallway AP, so you know, around AP placement, right? So a common mistake is gonna be, uh, um, yeah, not placing APs near the clients, right? Uh, too many APs, uh, Alan, good one there. Um, you know, yeah, uh, that's a that's one of those kind of uh, counterintuitive ones, right? You think, uh, well, we'll just put way more APs than we think we're going to need because uh, then we'll cover all our bases and we don't have to spend the time and money on actually properly engineering a solution. So if the budget allows, we'll just put, you know, maybe twice as many APs as we think we need. But, uh, you know, we'll talk. I saw uh, APs mounted too high. Ah, yeah, height. Height is a, a definitely a good factor there. Um, too many SSIDs. So that's another uh, interesting one that we could look at. So a little bit outside of the, uh, you know, the RF piece of it, more on the configuration side, and obviously relates to the RF piece as well. But uh, yeah, uh, co-channel interference. Um, you know, a lot of these things all kind of we can summarize uh, to a, a general category of um, AP placement, right, is going to have an impact on things like channel overlap. It's going to have an impact on um, yeah, the, the number of APs that you have, um, SNR, all those kinds of things. So yeah, I'm just kind of looking through the list here to see if there's anything else that we uh, haven't listed yet. So here's what I've got. APs in the hallways, too many APs, APs mounted too high, too many SSIDs. Uh, the number five kind of relates to, whoops, kind of relates to uh, uh, APs mounted too high. Uh, so I, I don't know, we could probably get one more in there, I'll bet. Yeah, there's quite a few. I'm trying to see if there's anyone that we haven't, that's on a completely different uh, subject that we haven't talked about yet of issues. Scroll through and see if there's anything else. I'll make the slide look pretty while you do that. Um, yeah, there's like a, a bunch of people around watching. Channel widths is another one. So uh, using oh, yeah. it's channel width. So yeah, channel planning. So I'll do poor, uh, I'll do poor plan. channel planning. Yep. Really good stuff. Basically what uh, me and Joel talked about yesterday when we were uh, kind of working on this and, and trying to put together some of these common mistakes, uh, we just, you know, decided to be lazy and said, you know, hey, instead of us coming up with the uh, common mistakes, let's, uh, let's pull the audience and see what hey, you guys think. Hey, Jerry, Jerry, hey, can I talk to you for a second? Uh, just kind of over here. Uh, we weren't supposed to tell them that part. <laughs> I don't know if oh, was that just between us? Yeah, I, was, yeah. I wasn't supposed to let the audience know. Yeah, and we weren't supposed to tell them that we that this was yesterday. We were supposed to say like four weeks ago, you know, to make it. <laughs> so anyway, let's not do that any. You know, I don't know, just just for future reference. So okay, yeah, we're back now. Uh, sorry for sorry for that, that brief delay. Uh, so cool. I think I think we got some great ones to to go off of here, and so. Um, so I, I think, so may, I don't know, should we talk about, uh, what do you want to do here, Jared? Do you, should we talk about why, like what the problems with these are? And maybe we can model up some examples and that how kind of show, you know, like why, why these are bad and why they, they can become a common mistake in office and enterprise Wi-Fi. What do you think of that plan? I think that uh, sounds like a great next uh, place to start. So let me uh, grab the, uh, the screen share here and I'm going to share my screen. And let's go ahead and yeah, run through some different things here. Let me move some of these zoom windows off the screen so I have a little more real estate to work with. Okay, so yeah, I've got Echo pulled up here and uh, let's go ahead and to kind of speed things up here to start to dive into these. I'm gonna just open the uh, office, office example project file here to start with. So. Let's go under the uh, documents here. We should see our uh, Echo House site survey folder and let's find the uh, example projects here. I'm gonna open up the uh, office planning example here. And let's uh, use this as our starting point. The nice thing about the uh, office uh, planning example is that uh, it should allow us to work with a, a multi-floor office and that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about of these kind of common mistakes, especially kind of ties in, 
And apparently this is not the uh, project file I was looking for. Let me double check. This is not the project file you were looking for. That's right. That's right. I must have saved this one over the top of, uh, of the uh, default one here. So give me one second. Uh, worst case, we'll pull in some uh, floor plans here. If, uh, you know, there's always, uh, uh, there's always that assurance that when you're going to demo something, something is going to go wrong. So, uh, Timothy's got a good one. He, he says, I, I see a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of people with too few APs customer says, you know, I heard I can do a, a certain amount of thousand square feet with a, with per AP. And, uh, you know, they're trying to cover somewhere between six and 10,000 square feet with, with each AP. Timothy, I don't know about you, but I hate blanket rules like that. You know, I, I don't, I, I like, I prefer to always, you know, design to requirements, right? I don't really care, you know, how many square feet each AP is going to cover. What I care about is, are we going to be able to achieve requirements with the number of AP, you know, with a certain number of APs? That's what I'm always concerned about. Hey, while Jerry is working on this, I'm actually going to take a moment to uh, shamelessly promote our next webinar. Uh, if you, uh, if you decide that, uh, that this webinar was not, a, was, uh, was not enough of a train wreck that you would be willing to join another Ekahow webinar, uh, we've got one coming up real soon here. Check our, or check our Twitter page, check our, our webinar page, but, uh, we're going to actually have, uh, we're going to have people from Cisco, Aruba and Ruckus all in the same webinar to talk Wi-Fi, And so, uh, be sure to go check that out. Uh, we could probably share some, some more concrete details than that, but uh, we've got an awesome webinar coming up and, uh, and maybe I'll put that up a little bit later. I'll prepare that while Jerry's doing, uh, doing some demo stuff. So, uh, it should be, uh, should be a real good time. Ooh, that looks good, Jerry. You got uh, everything you need. Yeah. So I think what I'm going to do is just so we can kind of walk through this a little bit better. I'm just going to clear off the uh, simulated access points out of here. We're just going to use this kind of as a shell. And uh, you can see we've got our floor plans imported. We've got our walls defined, our doors, you know, objects and things like that that we need to uh, talk through. We've covered that pretty extensively in previous webinars. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that part of it. But I want to talk about, you know, we've got our office environment here. And uh, this right now is just a flat, you know, a single floor plan. Um, but this, uh, you know, we need to factor this in in 3D. And that's one of the common mistakes I wanted to talk about that I often do see in an office environment. Uh, you know, if you have a multi-floor office environment, or potentially you're just in a multi-tenant building and you have tenants above and below you that are going to most likely have Wi-Fi themselves, we need to account for that information as part of the uh, design and implementation and, and really optimization process, right? Um, so that's going to involve doing some type of uh, assessment, some type of survey uh, of the environment to be able to measure that and determine that. Um, so leveraging something like the Echo Sidekick with the Echo Site Survey application would allow us to see what other neighboring access points are in the environment and be able to map that out. So one of the first things I like to do when I get on site is go ahead and do uh, a proper assessment uh, and walk the site, walk the areas that are part of the scope of the work and record the results, see what other, uh, you know, even if there maybe I don't, the, the network that I'm deploying maybe doesn't have existing Wi-Fi, most likely they do, but let's say they don't. I still would do a survey just to be able to see what other type of neighboring uh, devices there is, as well as what other type of uh, potential interference sources do I need to contend with uh, on the Wi-Fi. So I went ahead and connected the uh, the sidekick, and to show you what that would look like, I'm going to turn off the uh, the, the areas and the uh, the walls here, so we can see that. So the first step would be, yeah, we go on site here. We've got our map loaded, our scale is set. Now I'm ready to start performing my survey. And I can go to the survey mode here and we can collect some data about the environment. So I'll kind of zoom in on the map a little bit here so we can see this a little better. And we come in the front door here and we start performing our assessment. I'm not going to spend too much time in this, but I just want to kind of show you what that process would look like. So we gather a bunch of data, walking around the building here, taking my measurements. Maybe I walk into each one of these rooms. You can kind of pretend with me here. Obviously, I'm just sitting at my desk, but this is, you know, if we went on site physically here, um, I've got my sidekick. If you're not familiar with that, this is what we're using to take these measurements. And you can see in the top right corner, those measurements coming in from, from my environment. And if I wanted to get some more detail while I'm surveying, I can actually pop this uh, bar up from the bottom of the screen here, and we can actually see more details. And maybe I want to even see that live while I'm walking around to see what's uh, what's happening there. 
All right, so let's, uh, let's say that's collected all the data that I need, so I'm gonna right click to stop that survey, and now we can have that, re that, that information into the, uh, the, the project file here uh, to include in my design, remediation, optimization plan, whatever it is that our, our goal is here. So now we have some real world data uh, that we can leverage, and you can see currently on the uh, real-time frequency monitor here that I've got pulled up, I'm in the live mode still, but if I wanna look at the data that I just captured, I'll toggle over to the survey mode, and now I have all that information recorded in the project file that I can actually step through, and I can see you know, in this section of the building, what other types of access points and what uh, channels are being used, what channel widths, uh, all that information that I can use to optimize. So you can see in my environment here, uh, there's several other uh, vendors and SSIDs, as well as channels and channel widths that are being occupied even on the five gigahertz side. So right here I can see yeah, there's some uh, definitely some uh, other people occupying the uni one, uni two uh, parts of the five gigahertz band. However, look at this, I've got wide open lanes here uh, in uni two extended and uni three uh, that I'll definitely wanna probably favor a little more heavily, at least in this section of the building. Um, if we go over to the 2.4 side, as expected, you know, you're going to see a lot of other activity in the 2.4 side. Um, so better to, you know, maybe just avoid that uh, as much as possible, or at least not uh, favor that side of uh, the, the band, just because, especially in a multi-tenant uh, environment, you're going to have a lot of activity in that part of the spectrum. Okay, so that's the, uh, you know, the, the, the pre- um, you know, kind of pre-planning assessment. You know, this is something now that I have some good information that I can use uh, about the environment. Uh, I can also use the same kind of process that we just talked about here to gather more details about the uh, environment to input that in the in the planning side of the tool. So we talked about, you know, walls briefly before. Let's turn those walls back on. And let's say I want to uh, flip over to the planning mode now, and we want to fine tune these settings on the wall. And after I went on site, I took some wall loss or obstruction loss measurements. Now I can go into the software here and I can calibrate that. I can actually change the wall type. I can edit the wall values. So in this case, we're using a drywall and it's currently set to three dBs, but I can go into here and I can globally uh, you know, fine tune those settings. I can say, actually, you know what? I went and measured on site and those walls are actually pretty dense. Maybe they've got some sound deadening material in them or, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, some other material in there that's causing some additional attenuation that I need to account for. And this is actually 5 dB instead of 3 dB. Now we can adjust that uh, globally in here and that will impact my planning, right? So if I go into here and we've adjusted our wall, uh, uh, attenuation. Now if I select that same wall that we were just looking at before, notice the dB value has been updated to that 5 dB. So we can fine tune uh, those values. Yeah, I think that's an important step to take because, you know, the, the thing to keep in mind when you're doing a, a virtual design or a predictive model, I call them the same, the same thing in my mind, you know, you are, you're basically creating a network simulation, but that simulation, that model is only going to be as accurate as the data that you put into it. And so that's why calibrating those walls is a really good idea. You know, we put some presets in there to help get you started, but I think it's super important to go in and actually calibrate those and make them what they are in the real world. And that'll help your, your model be more accurate. Now, one thing I was curious if anybody would call out in the, uh, the chat and, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, so one of the things I'm doing here is kind of crossing the streams, right? As I like to, to call it, of we're talking about survey data and predictive data, right? And uh, in general, I do actually recommend not to cross the streams uh, in the sense of we have measured data here and we also have simulated data on the map or simulated objects on the map, right? Like walls, doors, things like that. Uh, measured data is always going to trump the uh, simulated data. So measured is kind of the rock that doesn't move. Uh, simulation is obviously, uh, you know, kind of a um, scientific guess, we'll kind of say, and uh, allows us to use some math to visualize uh, and, and simulate the RF environment. Um, so the point that I'm trying to get to is uh, you could start with something like this, that this is how I like to kind of do this, whether the walls are there or not at this point. Uh, isn't too big of a deal. You just have to understand the impact of those.
but the purpose is, is once we get to actually doing a predictive model, we need to get rid of that measured data. Because like I said, the measured data is the rock that doesn't move. So you could either delete the, uh, the measured data out of here or uh, for reference, we may want to keep that. So, and, and I would recommend probably doing that. We can actually deselect this. So if I deselect it, what you'll see happen is the survey paths uh, remain in the project file. Um, but uh, uh, the data itself is not being uh, impacting the design. So what that allows me to do is collect some measured data, store that in the project file, but toggle it off. So now this uh, under my surveys here is my measured data. And now I can go back over to like my access points here and we can start simulating some access point locations. Uh, notice one of the other things that is nice about this, um, make this window a little bigger here. One of the other things that is nice about this is that uh, we can also um, uh, uh, keep the AP locations, you know, that it found these APs on the map, the measured AP locations. However, we're not visualizing the data. So I find this to be very helpful, uh, whether, you know, regardless of the environment, but, uh, you know, especially in office environments where you have multi-tenants and other access points that you're going to need to contend with. Okay, so let's kind of get back on track here. I feel like I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole there, but hopefully that uh, kind of yeah. clarifies how to define. Rabbit holes are, or rabbit trails are fun, man. <laughs> that's right. They can be useful. Just uh, make sure I don't go too far out there. Yeah, that's that's your that's your role as co-host, Joel, is to to reel me back in. Oh, hey, Jerry, Jerry, you're on, you're you're on the wrong path here. We need to get back to uh, right. talking about what happens when you place APs in hallways. Appreciate it. Okay, sure. Perfect. That's I got it. you back. I appreciate that. All right, so let's go ahead and grab an access point here and uh, yeah, place it uh, in some hallways. So I don't know, what's, uh, what's some of the common access points you guys are using these days? We'll, uh, we'll pull the chat and uh, you know, play around with maybe a couple of different model APs here if we have time. But uh, okay, 3502s, well, Peter's still uh, rocking some 3502s, uh, 3802s. MR 32s and 33s, MR 52s, Ruckus R 510s. Seen, seen a lot of 32s in there. So let's go ahead and play with the 32s because those do have some unique things that, uh, you know, uh, especially in an office environment could be uh, pretty useful. So when we punch in 3802s in the uh, AP list here, uh, you see there's two different 3802Is, Is for integrated antennas, Es for external antennas. Uh, so we're going to be using the Is typically in an office environment. We're going to probably want to leverage those Is. Um, so let's go ahead and choose the traditional 245 uh, to start with. And I'll show you how we can convert that into a dual 5 AP. But let's kind of start with, uh, you know, what was talked about in chat about, you know, some of the bad things that we're seeing uh, in these kind of office uh, environments, uh, you know, bad Wi-Fi deployments. And probably actually these would even be spaced out a little bit more to kind of paint this picture a little bit better. But let's, uh, yeah, kind of slide this AP down here a little bit. I don't know. I think you're going to have to have a lot of APs to get coverage into those rooms, you know, that's true. And, and more APs. I mean, that's not a bad thing, right? Well, just a lot, a lot of times, you know, this is what I see, right? You know, you've got a hallway, you know, like this corridor, like this, you're probably going to do like, uh, you know, two, maybe three APs per corridor. You know, let's kind of start with a bare minimum. And then we can say, you know, this is, we'll kind of do the whole knee jerk reaction that we talked about and start to fill in those, uh, those gaps. Oh, I should also show you guys this new, uh, we probably have talked about this oh, yeah. the coverage planning mode. Uh, this can be pretty handy, especially for this type of uh, concept. Um, so the coverage planning mode just sets the uh, uh, edge of the cell based on the slider at the bottom here. And now all I have to do is move my mouse around the map and you'll see this update in real time. I know it's a little sluggish coming across Zoom here, but uh, you can actually see it. I don't even have to click or do anything. I just move my cursor wherever I think I might want to place an AP. And it's going to paint the uh, edge of that cell based on currently that negative 67 cutoff. Um, all right, so let's say we're just going to kind of use this hallway concept, and I'm going to keep moving uh, things over here. Hey, uh, David says that's amazing, so I just <laughs> want to let you know, Jerry. We agree, awesome. David. <laughs> the first time I saw that, I was like, what? Yeah, it's pretty slick for this type of stuff. You know, the thing to keep in mind uh, is that uh, it's just the... Um, uh, you know, it's just coverage, right? So this is a uh, you know great for these kind of quick, rough, uh, predictive designs. And uh, you know if we want to see roughly how many APs it's going to take, and want to manually define that, uh, that allows to do that. 
Okay, so let's say, you know, maybe that's our starting point, right? We think uh, that's going to be, we, we, didn't, we didn't actually design this in Akahel, but this is just what we ended up with. Um, I'm going to also clear off these uh, um, uh, uh, simulated access points to kind of clean this up a little bit. I'm going to tell it to only uh, place my access points on the map here, so that way we get rid of all the other kind of rogue or neighboring access points that are uh, showing up there. And uh, there we go. Okay, so now we've got uh, just our simulated access points showing up here on the map. And you know, this is kind of what we're going to be left with. Let's flip back over the signal strength view so we can see more of that traditional kind of view. And also, if you don't want to see this uh, survey path on here, even though we're, we're keeping the data, uh, we can also toggle that under the uh, view options. You can see right here, we can turn off those survey paths. So we can keep all that survey data in there, but not have it getting in the way. So Jerry, one question I have too is, how many square feet is this building? You know, we set the scale uh, earlier before the webinar started. I guess you used the CAD import, so it brought the scale in automatically. But how many square feet is that? Okay, so that's, uh, am I reading that right? 22,000 square feet? It is 120, or no, 12,000 square 12, feet. 12,000 square yeah. feet. So we've got, so we've got um, uh, 11 APs, but we've got 12,000 square feet. And so, uh, eight APs. what's that? Eight, eight APs is what we we're eight, working with currently. Eight APs and 12,000 square feet. And so, uh, you know, the, 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 a comment came up earlier, I think it was from Timothy about, you know, a certain amount of, so that's one AP for, for every 1500 square feet. That's exactly what that comes down to. So the question that I have is, does this prove that, you know, that blanket statement like that one AP every 1500 square feet, does it work? You know, looking at yeah. looking at the results here, d does it work? And I'm going to yeah. say, no. <laughs> I'm going to say absolutely not. It completely depends on the environment. And in this environment with these walls, no, that's not enough APs. You know, whether the APs are in a good place or a bad place, it's simply not enough. Yeah. It's all about placement, right? And I mean, yeah, we could certainly still use these eight APs in better placements to get much better connectivity to our clients. You know, if we factor in, uh, not so much of where, you know, we want to just place APs and corridors, but where are actual clients in the building? And we prioritize those areas, push these APs out of there. And we know we're going to have, you know, let's say a lot of clients over here. And we know we're going to have a lot of clients, you know, maybe in this section, we can slide these APs out of the, uh, the corridors into those areas. And uh, now we can get a much better uh, experience for the majority of our users. Sure, yeah, we might have some dead spots in things like the hallways, um, but at least the majority of our clients are going to have a better experience. Now, it's still not a properly designed network, right? We're just kind of making the best of a bad situation, maybe because this is all we initially budgeted. Um, this is what we have to, to kind of work with. So rather than doing the knee-jerk reaction of putting the APs in, you know, on a desk in a conference room or something, now we start to kind of remediate this by first figuring out, okay, if we place the APs where they really should be, you know, where our clients are, how many more APs do we need to actually properly design this network? So I uh, had an interesting question come in from Nicholas. How do you recommend avoiding the uncomfortable political office battle when moving an AEP from a hallway into an office? We have a huge problem with that. And Nicholas, when you asked this question, I thought, ooh, you know, somebody's worried. They, they have, you know, one of those bogus health concerns, right? And then you had some clarification saying that uh, I guess there's a kind of an issue with favoritism where people are like, well, Jerry got an AP in his office. Why don't I get an AP in his office? <laughs> Nicholas, that's a, that is a, a very tough question. Uh, and you said that you even showed in Ekahau the survey results. And if that doesn't work, I really don't know what the answer is to that because I think my, my recommendation would be like, hey, look, anywhere that's green is good signal strength. Or you could even show the data rate map, right? Anywhere you can see what their, their, their uh, data rate, uh, you know, could potentially be in their office. Of course, it's based on their client device, blah, blah, blah. But maybe that one would help. Try the data rate visualization. Show them that and show them, hey, look, you're still getting, you know, 400 megabits per second, even though you and I both know that's not throughput that still might help, you know, ease in their mind. Like your data rate is just as good as the data rate of the person that has the AP in their office. So I hope that helps.
Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. I'm curious if anybody in the chat has uh, anything that they've uh, found that works well in those kind of situations. Um, you know, yeah, I, I can certainly see how that can be of like, you know, oh, this person must be like more important to, to the company because they have an access point inside their office you know, to make sure that they have great connectivity where, uh, you know, I'm across the hall, you know, uh, further away. Um, yeah, I could uh, I could certainly see how some office politics could uh, play into that. Um, you know, the first thought is, you know, don't show the APs at all, but then, you know, we go back to the whole AP placement side of things, you know, where if you put the APs above the ceiling, you know, that would eliminate that problem of people even being aware that there's an access point above their office or not. But, um, you know, now we're talking potentially impacting the quality of the signal by moving those access points further away from the clients. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was the 3D aspect of uh, moving these APs um, uh, you know, or factoring in these APs uh, three-dimensionally, right? So right now we're, we're kind of doing this simply because it's just a single floor plan. Uh, you know, if that's all you have to worry about, you know, you've got your, your life is much easier from an RF standpoint, but in reality, uh, RF goes in 360 degrees. So if we need to factor in the floor above and below, uh, how do we do that? Well, let's kind of cheat a little bit here and I'm just going to duplicate this map for the sake of time and we're going to create uh, a, two additional floor plans out of this one floor plan uh, using the uh, the magic here of the map tool and duplicate map. Uh, this is actually a really handy tool if you're working on something like a hotel or hospitality that has a lot of uh, you know floors that are identical. Um, you can set up one floor plan and then just duplicate it and uh, copy all the uh, the work that you may have done uh, manually to that floor. So I'm going to duplicate this floor plan twice. That way we have three total floor plans, and then we're going to create this into a three floor office building. All right, so we're gonna call that one floor three. And I'm going to call this middle one floor two, believe it or not. Maybe I should call, maybe I should really just mess with people and let's just call this one like floor five or something. Would that like drive somebody crazy? It would drive me crazy. Please do not. <laughs> Actually, I just called it floor three by accident. <laughs> we have two floor threes now. All right, there we go. All right, floor one, two, three. I don't want to drive anybody crazy on this uh, webinar any more than we already have. So let's yeah, I was going to say on. too late. <laughs> yeah, add building. All <laughs> yeah. right, so I go to the building tab. I'm going to set up this building. So this is how we create the uh, 3D propagation model. So by doing this and adding all three floors to my building, um, the one the last step that we have to do uh, that I could have uh, shaped some time off was add the alignment points first, but I forgot to do that. So we'll do this the more traditional way where we uh, drop the floor alignment points on the map. And I'll show you one little uh, uh, cheat for that one as well. So floor alignment points, we need at least flo uh, three floor alignment points. We actually added this little uh, requirement thing here. You can see up on the top right of the, uh, the echo window. Uh, so you can see here, it's telling me how many uh, uh, alignment points are required. You need at least three. So uh, I always like to try and do like a, a big triangle. So I'll do like corners of the building here like this. If uh, you know, the floors change in size as the building goes up, um, you know, leverage something like stairwells or elevator shafts. And so those tend to go through the entire building and not move. Um, but uh, yeah, let's go ahead and I wanna show you that um, one of the features that's nice is you can use the copy and paste on these floor alignment points to automate some of this on the other floors. So to do that, I'm gonna turn off the other layers, get those out of the way. All right, so there's my alignment points. I can actually just click on the map and do a control A uh, to select all, I believe I can. Oh, I'm on a Mac, Command A, sorry. Uh, Command A and then Command C to copy. So this is what happens when I switch between a, a Windows device to a Mac device after <laughs> keyboard shortcuts to use. All right, so Command C to copy those or you could go up to edit and uh, copy. And now I can go to the other floors and because these floors are identical, uh, they should paste in the uh, appropriate locations. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and do that. And I'm gonna turn off the uh, signal strength here for now too, just to speed this up a little bit. Edit, paste, there we go. And we'll go to floor two. And yeah, you can see on the left side here, currently the 3D status says to align the floors. So that's what we're doing here. Go to edit, command V, 
and we'll paste those. And now it's happy. You can see up in the top left, this little indicator went green, 3D status is okay. So now we have the 3D propagation model in full effect here. So what that means is if we go back to our signal strength visualization, remember all of our APs are currently on floor one. We haven't placed any APs on floor two or floor three. However, since we have the uh, signal propagation uh, set up here, the 3D modeling, we're starting to see some signal bleed through from the floor below to the floor above. And uh, currently the density of the floor is set to an office floor type uh, in the US here. You can see uh, in the EU, uh, a little bit denser floors, probably due to building codes or something like that, tend to have a little denser floors. So if this was a, a building in the EU, so we're looking at floor two right now. So this is the attenuation factor here, 9 dB per feet. If we flip that over to the office EU uh, density type, we'll see that should change uh, a fairly good amount there. So we're getting less bleed through there in the, uh, the EU offices. Now, if this is a thinner floor, you know, much bigger uh, impact, obviously the other direction as well, bigger factors there. Um, so you can see how we're seeing some pretty good hot spots above those APs. Now this is from the floor below to the floor above. Uh, what happens if we place some APs on floor three uh, with that same thin floor uh, parameter in between the, the two floors, uh, what do you think? Do you think we're going to see the same or is it going to be uh, worse or better? Let's just place an AP, I don't know, like uh, in the middle of the map here to make it easy to see. Okay, so there's our floor three coverage. Now, if we go down to floor two, again, this is set to thin floor. Um, but uh, yeah, notice the difference that we're going to see uh, on signal propagation, we should actually see about twice as much signal propagation from the floor above to the floor below uh, in comparison. So yeah, here's that big circle here from the floor above to the floor below. Remember APs typically, you know, we're mounting them on the ceiling or we're simulating it on the ceiling and it's gonna project downward, uh, out, down and out. So as it goes to the floor below, you're gonna have a much wider uh, a radius a uh, larger radius from that uh, access point, larger coverage kind of uh, cell from that uh, that'll propagate through. All right, what uh, what are we seeing in uh, chat? Uh, given the, the time that we're at, I wanna make sure we try and get through any other topics or questions that uh, you guys have for us. Yeah, well, I think one thing, Jerry, that I kind of like to look at is uh, whatever our original floor was, was, was it floor one? Uh, when you moved all the APs out of the hallways and into the rooms, uh, now obviously we don't have enough APs here to to you know effectively cover all this. We're we're still APs short. I'm going to just you know kind of roughly count one, two, three, four, five, six, probably about six more APs to get this whole thing covered properly, right? Yeah. Uh, and so uh, and so you know that that's. Yeah, that's one thing I'd kind of just like to point out is that, you know, uh, putting them in the hallways doesn't work because you don't get coverage in the rooms. That's where it matters. And also those blanket statements of, you know, one AP every 1500 square feet, those might, I mean, it might work maybe, but it's just, you're just, you know, either going to get lucky or not, you know, it's, it just depends on, on the, the building. And so I always design my I always design my networks with a set of requirements in mind. And I design to meet those requirements. So that's just one thing I wanted to point out. Um, as far as specific questions and stuff, uh, we do have a few, uh, a few good questions here. Did we want to go through any more like scenarios or anything, uh, you know, from, uh, from the, the list that we put together earlier? Do you think we have any time? I think from the agenda, one of the things that we haven't really talked about much is uh, the device side of things, right? So yes. everything that we've been kind of covering here has been just uh, general RF kind of good practice type stuff. But uh, one of the things, you know, when you're talking to office enterprises, you know, uh, the devices that you're designing for are going to have a big impact on this. Uh, and anytime we're talking about devices and device capabilities, uh, the, the first thing that comes to mind for me is going to be uh, that clients.michaelbono website. I'll just go ahead and pull that up here real quick. Um, this is actually uh, the best database that I'm aware of uh, where you can find uh, device capabilities. And uh, Mike's done a good job of kind of housing all this. And uh, this is all, you know, for the most, you know, Mike's done a bunch of this research himself, but uh, a lot of this is all community uh, sourced uh, type information. So if you have devices uh, in your possession or in your environment that uh, aren't on this list, 
I would encourage you to follow uh, Mike's instruction on here. We're actually going to be, uh, if you're coming to uh, WLPC, I'm going to be doing a session or in the, the session that I'm going to be doing there, we're going to be talking about uh, how to gather this information and uh, providing you some tools to easily gather this information about your devices. But yeah, what this is providing us here is, you know, on the five gigahertz side, what channels are supported or not supported, more importantly, um, but then some of the other capabilities of the client devices, you know, number of spatial streams that it has, n number of, you know, send and receive antennas, uh, which is going to have an impact on not only um, its performance, you know, max data rate, but also uh, on SNR, right, more antennas, uh, you know, more surface area for it to listen and combine those signals to. Um, but then you also have things like what other types of technology does it support? Is it 802.11n AC? Does it support things like multi-user MIMO, uh, 802.11v? Um, so lots of good info in here to, uh, to reference. Uh, what is the, there's another, yeah, here we go, max transmit power. That's the other one I was thinking of. I know somebody mentioned in chat before about, you know, channel planning and transmit power, uh, it, you, know, you know, not having that properly optimized is a big problem in office enterprise environments. And this is a good way to, uh, um, you know, kind of factor that in is figure out what your least capable device is. Let's say it's an iPhone. And now what are the typical max transmit powers of an iPhone? So if we scroll down to the uh, I section here and we've got all our iPhones, you can see there, uh, we go over to the uh, right and we can see there's our max transmit powers, which don't have huge swings, but you can see you have all the way down to an 18 dB max transmit power and up to uh, 24. Um, so we can see there is some, you know, that's a fairly good swing depending on even what model iPhone that you're kind of de defining or designing for. And even versions can have an impact too, right? You know, you might update the firmware on the device and, uh, you know, all of a sudden you've got users complaining after a firmware update, you do a, you know, a, look at the the requirement or the capabilities of the device and all of a sudden you realize the device's max transmit power is you know maybe certain db less than what it used to be uh because the manufacturer decided hey to optimize battery life we're going to reduce the max transmit power of the device to uh to improve battery life and now they've you know put that in their marketing materials um so yeah stuff to stuff to keep in mind so let's say that 18 db is our target uh that we're that we're going after um so if we need to factor that into our simulation uh let's go ahead and do a quick select here i'm going to select all my simulated access points and i'm going to select all of my five gigahertz radios so here's my 802.11 ac simulated radios and i'm going to say edit the selected simulated radios and we're gonna make all of those be uh, that 18 dB uh, transmit power. And honestly, I don't even like to set the access points to 18. If uh, that's really my target is the, the clients having a maximum transit power of 18 dB, I don't wanna design my access points to be running that hot. Uh, actually 14 would probably be a pretty good value. I usually like to design for at least three dB less than what the client's maximum transit power is. Uh, so maybe we'll bump this up to 15 that still gives us a 3 dB buffer uh, to make sure those clients aren't having to talk at maximum transmit power all the time. All right, so you can see that slightly changed the model since that was only a 1 dB change from what we currently had it at, but that is something that we wanna factor into the, uh, the planning and the design. Cool, well, uh, yeah, what, uh, what else do we wanna talk about? Uh, well, uh, I think we've got some really great questions here that I'd like to uh, that I'd like to cover, and uh, and I don't know how how in depth we want to go, but uh, you know maybe some of them we just answer verbally, and some of them we you know maybe can do a little example of something like that. So uh, if you have questions, please uh, be sure to go put those in the Q and A tool and upvote uh, any other other people's questions that you like, uh, and we'll uh, we'll go through some questions here. So um, a good question. Um, from uh, Walid is uh, what rec what is Ekahau's recommendation for in an office or enterprise environment a continuous survey or a stop and go survey Jerry what do you say yeah this actually uh, there was a good discussion on the uh, Wi-Fi Pro Slack uh, channel recently around this and uh, uh, Keith Parsons actually made some good points in there around you know just the number the pure number of data points that you collect uh, in the difference between a stop and go and a continuous. Um, I'm not going to say one is right or wrong. I'll give you my personal kind of uh, opinion on it. I know there's different, you know, this is one of those topics that kind of it depends. Um, but uh, I think for me, most of the time, probably I'd say 90% of the time, I'm going to be doing a continuous survey. And the, the 
pure reason for that is because uh, when you're doing a continuous survey, you are gathering a lot more data. And that's really what it uh, boils down to is just, you know, what is going to provide you the most amount of samplings and data points, because more samplings, more data points um, are going to produce more uh, accurate results. Now, that being said, the important other piece of that is, you know, where are those data points falling on the map and making sure that those are accurately being placed. Uh, so let's just take a look at that real quick. And uh, while I'm doing this, Joel, you want to kind of share your uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm basically in the same boat. So in the argument versus, you know, continuous versus stop and go with a continuous survey, Ekahau is always gathering data points as you walk. It's, it's always getting data points. With the stop and go, we only get one data point whenever we click. So you just don't get as many data points with stop and go. So here's how I use it. Uh, for large open spaces that are easy to navigate, hallways, auditoriums, cafeterias, like, you know, big open spaces, outdoor environments, I'm always going to use the stop and or the continuous survey. Oof, as if that could have been a fatal mistake right there. Continuous for open areas. For small and closed spaces that are difficult to navigate, I use uh, stop and go. So a good example is I had to survey a building with, uh, with little kids like preschool kids uh, in classrooms. And uh, one of the few things that being a parent has taught me is that stepping on kids is bad. You're not supposed to do that apparently. Uh, don't ask me how I know. Um, and so the stop and go survey was really useful for, you know, taking data points uh, in a room that a bunch of kids were playing in. And so uh, that's what I always do. Uh, uh, you know, continuous survey 90% of the time, uh, stop and go 10% of the time uh, with, you know, I, I highly favor the continuous survey. So back to you, Jerry. Yeah, so I started a continuous survey here. I had to reconnect the sidekick here. I turned it off while we were doing the other planning demo. But uh, yeah, I've got my sidekick connected now. So we've got, there's two Wi-Fi radios inside the sidekick. So this makes for some pretty quick measurements here. Uh, one good indicator of that is if you look in the top right corner of my screen, you can see these little blips uh, show up every couple of seconds here. Uh, or, and I guess the, you know, the number changing is what I'm referring to as kind of that blip uh, is every time that dB value changes, that's a good indication that a sampling has been finished. Um, but let's go ahead and look at, you know, how do we see those samplings after we've completed the survey? Um, so here I just did a continuous survey. And now what I'm going to do is flip over to this little magnifying glass tool here. This is the survey inspector. And when I click on the survey inspector, you're going to see uh, these individual little bumps along the survey path. Let me get the axis points off the map here to make this a little clearer. And yeah, so notice these little gray dots. If I actually click on one of these gray dots, you'll actually notice, uh, oh, uh, well, I'm on the survey inspector mode, click on one of the gray dots here. And uh, notice now they turn orange. What that's indicating is which survey path uh, uh, and specifically which radio of that survey path I have now selected. Um, there's actually two dots kind of on top of each other there. If we zoom in, we can probably see those a little bit clearer. Yeah, notice they're pretty tightly together because the sidekick radios uh, are evenly kind of matched. There's two 802.11 AC radios that are scanning at the same time. And we have one that's sweeping the upper five gigahertz channels, the, the mid and upper. And then the other one is sweeping all of the 2.4 in my regulatory domain here, as well as all of the lower uh, five gigahertz channels uh, as well. And those are evenly split. So in my regulatory domain, uh, what is it, Joel? 36 channels total. So 18 uh, per radio is what we're scanning. That's what we're, each radio is sampling uh, 18 channels. Um, so that puts them pretty tightly together. Why are they not exactly identical? Well, uh, the one radio that's switching between 2.4 and 5 gigahertz uh, does have a slight, uh, you know, it'll take slightly longer to switch bands. So they're not going to be directly on top of each other, but they're going to be pretty darn close. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's, you know, to, to go back to the initial question, uh, there's my uh, um, continuous survey. So if I did that as a stop and go, that means that to get the same amount of detail and data, I would have had to do that many stop and go measurements, you know, especially down a corridor like that. Uh, it would have taken me a, a really long time. Typically, stop and go, I don't know what mine's configured to right now, but uh, yeah, minimum stop and go wait time by default is at five seconds. Uh, you can configure that in your preferences. We have that set to five seconds because even with like the sidekick, that means you're going to get two full samplings uh, in each stop and go measurement. The benefit I will say about stop and go is it gives you complete control 
over where those samplings are taken. So if I need to ensure that I get, let's say maybe one or two samplings inside every office, um, stop and go is gonna give me that level of control and detail. So let's say maybe I wanna take one in the corner of this office and I wanna take one uh, just inside the door. Uh, I know exactly where those data points are gonna land on there with continuous survey. You know, it could have been in the, the sampling could have landed in the middle of the room, maybe just outside the door. Um, I'm going to get a lot more data, but like I said, I, I lose some of that control. Uh, so it comes down to, yeah, really more uh, speed uh, and, and accuracy uh, in some sense, but more data uh, is going to be more accurate in almost every scenario. So Jerry, a question that's been coming in, uh, several people in the chat have put this in, I managed to catch those in there, uh, is uh, can you perform both stop and go and continuous uh, in the same project file? Yeah, absolutely. Just like we did here, you can see we have both uh, stop and go and continuous. So yeah, that is a, a somewhat common scenario, especially let's say in like a healthcare setting, I found like in medical centers, I'll always start with a continuous survey, cover as much as I can with a continuous survey. And then maybe in the afternoon, I come back up and see if any patient rooms have opened up and uh, may fill in those gaps using stop and go measurements. There's nothing to stop you from doing that. But at the same time, you know, it doesn't hurt to just do them as short continuous surveys too, right? So um, yeah, you can certainly uh, play around with it, see what works best for your workflow, I would say. Um, and maybe the, oh, the other thing I would say about stop and go that I would highly recommend using that for is if you ever need to do throughput testing. Uh, throughput testing, uh, we can do that with the internal adapter. I can set this to do a throughput test and I do have an iPerf server set up on my network here. It's already configured. So now uh, I could do a stop and go measurement, you know, maybe fill in, you know, in these individual rooms doing stop and go measurements and doing a throughput test as part of my passive assessment. So that's a, another, you know, reason for using stop and go or maybe using stop and go in addition to your continuous survey is to do some of these throughput measurements. And there you go, 135. Let me draw an arrow here so you guys can see that we can actually see what our current throughput results look like to Jerry's local iPerf server. Looks like he's, we're seeing about 153 megabits per second uh, over whatever connection he has right now. Uh, a question uh, from Jeff, I think this is a good time to answer, is Jeff asks, does the continuous survey use GPS? Uh, answer to that, Jeff, is no. Uh, the continuous survey, we're basically telling ECHO whenever we change directions. So you just keep walking and you just click when you change directions. Uh, the GPS survey is only used in outdoor environments. And even more than that, keep in mind that GPS is actually pretty inaccurate. Uh, we only get, I think it's about a th within three meter accuracy. So it's not very accurate. Uh, so if you're surveying, let's say that instead of a floor plan, you put in a, uh, a screenshot or a, an image export from Google Earth and you're surveying like a campus environment, right? You can click on sidewalks more accurately than a GPS can know where you are. And so when you're doing, uh, when you're doing an outdoor environment with a GPS, um, I, uh, I only recommend using it if there are no identifiable landmarks in the area that you're surveying. Uh, a good example of that would be a field, right? There's nothing to, you don't even know where you are in the field, right? Because there's no, there's no landmarks to go off of. Or uh, even more commonly than that, it's like an open pit mine environment where it's just a bunch of dirt and it changes all the time and you have no idea where you are to click. That's where the GPS survey comes in, uh, in really handy. So in the end, you can be more accurate with your clicks than a, a GPS. I hope that helps. Very good. Are you all done there, Jerry? Do you want to tackle the next question here? Yeah, absolutely. Let's pound cool. through as many as we can. All right. Uh, this, I actually have a question, or this is a question from Mario, but I have the exact same question. I actually don't know the answer to this. So uh, Jerry, uh, you, I'm going to rely on you a lot here. Uh, what is the best way to measure floor attenuation, to set proper floor attenuation? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, in my eyes, it's just the same process as measuring any type of wall or obstruction loss. Um, you're going to measure, you're going to put some type of signal generating device on the, the floor, above the floor that you're trying to measure. Um, you know, it can get a little bit tricky depending on, yeah, can you, oh, I guess, yeah, you, you'll obviously be able to get above and below the floor if that's uh, going to be part of the factor into your design. But you're going to put an AP and get it as high up as you know you can. You don't want to be taking a measurement right next to the access point. Um, but I think it's something like uh, ideally the range is I want to say like six or nine meters. We have a blog uh, article on this that uh, Wi-Fi Nigel has put together. Um, but uh, there's a, a 
a measurement distance that you want to take. Essentially, what we're trying to do is capture the signal on each side of that object. So, it's in, you know, you want to measure right at the floor. Uh, you know, you have the AP up here. You have the um, uh, you take a measurement at the floor and then you're going to go directly underneath that and try and line yourself up so that you're taking a measurement directly underneath the, you know, where you took that measurement above the floor. And let's say uh, on the top of the floor, you know, with no obstruction loss there, um, you have negative, we'll say 30, and now you go below the floor and it's negative 40. That's a 10 dB loss that we can factor in with that uh, obstruction, with that, with that floor. And uh, Peter just posted a link to our very own blog post uh, in the chat there. Thanks, Peter. Appreciate that. That uh, that talks about how to measure those obstructions and factor those into uh, uh, into uh, Ekahau. So perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. That's exactly the one I was referring to. Yeah. And a uh, question from Jamal. Uh, you know, how do you know when to change the dB rating of walls? Exact same thing. Go look at that article. That will explain how to change that, and you can plug those values into Ekahau. Uh, so, you know, for example, in a building like this, there's a lot of drywall that's in there already. Uh, yeah, Jerry, you're, you're, you're uh, doing what I'm thinking here. I appreciate it. Uh, so Jerry drew a bunch of drywall into this building. And so the cool thing is if you go measure three or four of these walls and you find out that on average, the drywall is maybe four dB, all you have to do is go edit that single drywall preset in there. So Jerry has selected drywall. He's now changing it to four dB and then he'll hit the enter button. Boom, that just changed all the drywall in the entire project file to four dBs. And don't worry about messing up the presets in Ekahau. When you start a new project file, these go right back to where they were before. We intended for you to change these. Mess with them all you want because that's, that's what they're there for. Um, if, and if you do want to keep the uh, you know, reference of the, uh, the original one in this project file, just hit that duplicate button. And now we've made a copy of that one. And then we can edit this one. We can change the color of it. You can change the name of it, uh, you know, DB value. And now once we have our custom wall, we'll call this one. Custom drywall. Ooh, there, sounds let's, fancy. Uh, let's make it a different uh, color as well to, uh, to represent this. But yeah, then once we have our custom wall, we can um, uh, just add it like maybe a group of walls or you know, a certain section, like maybe find out. Uh, we'll, we'll make these ones, I don't know what, make them pink, make them really stand out. I was gonna say pink, yeah. <laughs> yeah there we go. It's just like uh, it's in your face, you know? Yeah, so now let's say we find out this kind of section in the middle of the building here is uh, these, these pink walls, these, these custom walls. Um, then we can factor that in using, let's just use our select tool. I'm just gonna select uh, like a couple of these here. We'll say all of these are our cool new pink walls. And we're gonna say edit or change wall type. And now in our list, if we scroll to where our cool custom wall is at the top, we'll select that. And now you can see those will stand out as our custom walls. So we can swap those out. So yeah, like Joel said, don't get too bent on, especially in the early planning stages, getting those parameters exactly right. There's always a uh, kind of ways to, to work around that and, and calibrate that later on. Yeah. I'll even draw in walls. I have no idea what they are. I'll draw them in ahead of time and go on site and go, Oh, that's this kind of wall, you know, and then plug my values in. So you can do all kinds of stuff like that. A uh, question from Jeff that I want to answer real quick, this one won't take long, uh, is uh, uh, in which cases is it best to give all APs the same SSID? That's a great question, Jeff. Uh, it's best to do that in any environment where you want that SSID to cover all over the place. And so, you know, we've all been to like a, a little hotel somewhere where they had like, you know, every room had its own access point and then they gave each access point its own SSID. So like room 503 has its own SSID. I don't recommend doing that. You know, I recommend just do hotel Wi-Fi just for the whole floor, for everything. And that way users only can see one network to connect to. They connect to that one network and then their devices more or less will pick the, uh, pick the loudest access point and automatically connect to that. So uh, you might have some cases though where you might only provide, you know, uh, a certain SSID in the warehouse and you might provide a different SSID in the office. You know, it just kind of depends on, uh, on what your needs are. So I hope that helps, but usually you're going to go with the same SSID all over the place. So... Uh, cool. Uh, Jerry, we probably have time for one more question before we close things out. So I'm looking through to make a decision here. Um, let's see. I'm going to look for one of the more higher rated ones here. I'll answer Kurt's real quick while you're looking for that. Uh, Kurt had a question that had a few upvotes on there. 
uh, any plans to allow you to export Wi-Fi locations in PDF or DWG to make it easier to integrate, uh, we'll say, wireless access point locations into, uh, or wireless AP locations into construction documents. Um, that has uh, come up a few times and I'm glad to see there's some, uh, some upvotes on that. Uh, nothing currently in the, uh, the near term roadmap, but I will certainly take that uh, inquiry back to our uh, product management team and uh, you know, let them know that that definitely was a popular uh, inquiry. I see another thumbs up on that one. So um, yeah, any, uh, maybe in chat, you can throw some more details about there. Any particular, um, you know, it says location to construction documents, any particular format or anything you're looking for besides, I guess, you know, besides just being output in a, a PDF or DWG, is there any other particulars that you need in that? If, uh, if you have those details also, you can shoot me an email. It's just jerry at echohow.com and happy to uh, talk with you more about that and make sure I get that uh, up to our uh, product management team. Uh, one last question before we close things out. Uh, good question from Kurt. Uh, I've noticed that, that in the field, the sidekick shows a stronger signal strength than my mobile device or tablet. Any way to adjust the sidekick to mimic another device? So, Kurt, you got us. Uh, it turns out that the Sidekick has excellent receive sensitivity. It's got two basically AP grade radios on board. So the receive sensitivity is very good. Uh, so our strategy for handling that is to offset signal strength, just like you suggested. So uh, Jerry is going to show you hopefully he is, uh, he's going to show you a method where you can actually offset that signal strength to bring it down to match whatever uh, device you want. Yeah, and this is another Jerry. one where I will uh, reference a, uh, another great website out there if you're not familiar with it. Uh, Blake uh, Crony has put together a uh, website called rssicompared.com. So yeah, clients.michaelbono and rssicompared.com definitely two that you want to have uh, bookmarked. And uh, yeah, these ones uh, will be very helpful for those two, uh, you know, things that we're talking about. One on the planning side and what the client capabilities are, but then two on the validation side. And we want to validate what the Wi-Fi looks like based on that client's uh, capabilities. Um, so yeah, Joel's writing all over my screen. Appreciate that, Joel. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's just look at this real quick and then factor this in. So we were talking about iPhones before, right? So let's go ahead and use this. Uh, I see it towards the top of the list here. There's one, uh, an iPhone 7. You can use the search and you can even, uh, there's a cool new feature in there now where you can even like aggregate all the mobile phones together and just use like an average of what your typical mobile phones receive sensitivity is. So yeah, here you can see like this device comparison. We can even specify like all laptops, all mobiles, scanners, those kinds of things. But uh, let's compare the uh, iPhone here against the uh, Sidekick. So uh, we can punch in now Sidekick and we're gonna compare an iPhone 7 to a Sidekick in its receive sensitivity. Uh, so this is another one of those user or community submitted uh, type things. So uh, Blake's done an awesome job housing this information and providing the instructions on how to gather this. But now what we're looking at is on the 2.4 band, what is the typical receive sensitivity of a sidekick compared to an iPhone 7? And we can see uh, if we look at like, let's say like the, the median uh, DBM here, we can see iPhone 7 typically is at negative 51 in the test, where in the same test, uh, the sidekick was at 40. So that's an 11 dB uh, better receive sensitivity that the sidekick is showing compared to that iPhone 7. Go over to the five gigahertz side, uh, kind of similar uh, 58 to 44. Uh, so we're, we're talking some pretty big dB uh, differences. So if we just take, uh, you know, just to show that the, what I'm doing here is I'm just taking 58 minus 44, and that's a 14 dB uh, difference on the five gigahertz side. So let's factor that in. Negative 14 on the five gigahertz and negative 11 on the, uh, the 2.4 is now our offsets that we're gonna apply. And uh, keep in mind, you know, we're kind of crossing the streams a little bit here because we're, we're in this one webinar talking about the planning side and jumping back and forth between planning and surveying. Uh, I wouldn't recommend applying any of these offsets to your planning side. This is purely for validation after you've done the measurements with the sidekick because now we have a, a starting point, right? This receive sensitivity of the sidekick compared to the receive sensitivity of a particular device. So let's go ahead and apply that profile here. And I'm gonna actually get rid of all of my simulated data and we're just gonna look at measured data. Um, Keep crossing the streams, Jerry. That's right. See, this is what, uh, this is what I was worried about, trying try not to lose people cro crossing the streams. 
All right, so I'm gonna say, let's just do this quickly here for the sake of time. I'm going to select all of my simulated radios and let's just get those off the map. That'll be the fastest way to uh, get rid of those. We could have also just disabled them, but yeah, we'll just delete those off the map. So now we only have our measured data uh, to, to look at. All right, so there's my measured data uh, from my fake little survey that I did. You can see right now we're visualizing this based on the measured data. But if I hold down my hidden modifier key here, uh, I guess the key isn't hidden, but the uh, modifier key allows you to see these hidden options. By default, when you click the uh, legend, this is what you're gonna see. However, if I hold down on the Mac, the Alt Option key on Windows, the Control key, and now I click the legend, you're gonna see this new view as option pop up. This is kind of an advanced feature. So we've got that uh, hidden by default, but now we can apply that DB offset. Um, and now you'll notice, you know, that obviously the visualization changes quite a bit. And in the legend, it also represents those values. Um, so now we get a much more accurate picture of what that least capable device is going to, you know, what their experience is gonna be like and what their um, performance is gonna look like uh, from a signal strength standpoint, right? So now we can see uh, see what that looks like, get a better picture of that. And this will be also possible to output in your reports as well, right? So you could even run multiple reports, maybe say, okay, here's what the network looks like from a laptop's point of view. Here's what it looks like from a mobile phone. Uh, you can run different reports against that as well. Great. Thanks for that uh, demonstration, Jerry. Uh, I think that we uh, we should probably go ahead and wrap things up. We're about eleven minutes over, and I want to you know make sure that uh, uh, make sure we get everybody back to uh, what, back to their day uh, uh, back to their their day on time here. Um, so, um, hey, uh, one thing I wanted to point out really quick, uh, if you want to, if you haven't used Decahow, if you're not an Decahow user already and you want to give it a test drive, uh, then you can always go to uh, ekahow.com forward slash evaluate and we would be happy to, uh, to hook you up with a, uh, with a trial license for Echo House so you can take it for a spin and, and uh, play with, uh, with some of these uh, features and things like that that we've, uh, that we've shown today. Um, and one more thing before, oh, I lost the window, I was gonna have it all ready to go. Here, here I go, I found it. Um, uh, uh, one question that we received last second here is when is, uh, when is our next webinar from Walter? Uh, this is the webinar that I was talking about earlier. Uh, coming up on February 12th, we are doing stadium Wi-Fi with Cisco, Aruba, and Ruckus. So we're gonna have uh, Jeanette from Ruckus, Matt from Cisco, and Marcus from uh, Aruba HP Enterprise here with us. And we would love to see you on that webinar. This one should be a lot of fun. So just go to, uh, go to the webinars page, ekahow.com, click on uh, training, click on webinars, and that will be there in the list. Go ahead and get and sign up for that. That one should be fun, maybe even more fun than, uh, than this webinar was. We'll get this uh, posted here in just a couple hours. Our Amazing marketing team is really quick at, uh, at getting these posted. So keep an eye out on our website for, uh, for the recorded version of this webinar. Hey, thanks for being here. Thanks for hanging out with Jerry and I for about an hour and 20 minutes. We really appreciate your time and we appreciate all the, the awesome discussion that, that you all added to the, uh, uh, to the webinar today. We will see you in a future Ekahow webinar. See you soon.